This is Red Eyes Radio. From the visible to the obscure. RedEyesCreations.com Greetings, friends. Good to talk to you again. Welcome if you're joining us for the first time. My name is Henrik Palmgren. And if you need to familiarize yourself with our program, please go to our website, redicecreations.com. And you can listen to the 100 plus or so hours of radio that we have available for free on demand on our website. We also have a TV program and a member section with much more films, second hour radio shows, videos, commentary, music, and much more. Filmmaker and author Jay Widener is with us today on the program to talk about Kubrick's Odyssey. Secrets Hidden in Films of Stanley Kubrick. We begin to look closer at Eyes Wide Shut and uh, how it connects with mind control, the elite, their deviant sexual behavior with orgies and pedophilia. And we explain this in the context of archonic, uh, demonic and satanic forces. Kubrick told an important story with all his films and uh, they all connect in some way as well. The question is if Kubrick actually was murdered considering what kind of message he tried to get across to his audience. This has to do with NASA, the Saturnian cult, the secret space program, the Ringmakers, Lord of the Rings, and even Arthur C. Clarke. We span all across the conspiratorial and symbolic board with Jay Widener, so please stay with us for a fascinating two hours. Welcome back to Red Eyes Radio, Jay Widener. It's uh, been about uh, three and a half years, I think, since we talked uh, last time uh, back in 2007. It's uh, good to have you with us again, uh, Jay. How are you? Hey, it's great to be back. I'm great. How are you, Henry? I'm uh, I'm excellent. Thank you for asking. Yeah, uh, You really have been doing a lot of work since we last talked with you. Obviously, I think the the biggest and uh, most uh, one of the most important development that, that you've been working on is the uh, new Kubrick films, uh, three-part series. The first one of these are, are out right now. Uh, it's called Kubrick's Odyssey. And, and I know as long as I've been following your work, uh, Jay, that you've been into uh, the works of, of Kubrick, uh, alchemical Kubrick, as you call him, anyway. Uh, what is so alluring about his work, uh, Jay? Maybe we can begin to talk about this and, and uh, your film, of course. Uh, yeah, well, uh, Stanley Kubrick is, uh, uh, in my view, the uh, the most consummate of all filmmakers because he not only had the intellectual background needed to be a good filmmaker, uh, but he also had the uh, talent, uh, visual talent. Uh, his films are incredibly visual, and they don't seem to erode. Even films as old as Paths of Glory still hold up really well. And um, so it was a combination of his intellectual skills and his technical skills that attracted me, and the fact that he uh, didn't like to tell stories in the way that Hollywood prefers stories to be told, and that attracted me. But most of all, it's his content, and uh, uh, each film takes a different part of the human drama and breaks it apart so that we can understand it and therefore ourselves a lot better. And um, my whole thesis, of course, is that he was, uh, after Dr. Strangelove, when the military saw the technical feat that he did creating the B-52 bombers, uh, they realized that this guy was really good, and they hired him to do the Apollo, fake the Apollo moon landings, which is not to say they didn't go to the moon. I do believe they have gone to the moon, but mm-hmm. I don't believe what they showed us was uh, was uh, really uh, true, and I think I proved beyond any shadow of a doubt in the new film, Kubrick's Odyssey, how he did it, uh, showing devastating evidence of it. And, um, and then I go into um, The Shining, which is not really about uh, a Stephen King novel at all. It's really the secret story of what Stanley had to go through while he was doing the Apollo landings and what he put his wife through and his family and himself through. And uh, that I have a serious amount of new evidence, which is going to really make some people squirm. And... uh, People think that I'm going to get sued by NASA or the Kubrick family, and uh, I really don't think I am going to get sued because if they do sue me, 
I'm going to uh, take them to court, and I'm going to bring in Hollywood special effects artists who are going to testify in court that I am right about the front screen projection process and its use in the Apollo program. Mm -hmm. So if they want to take me to court, let's go for it. Let's get a jury. And uh, we'll let them decide uh, whether Stanley Kubrick faked the Apollo moon landings mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. And I would predict that I win by a long shot. Interesting. Yeah, well, as long as they don't have uh, the control of the court, I guess, in that sense. But <laughs> that's another well, story. Well, <laughs> I mean, I would demand a jury. I would demand a jury trial. I wouldn't let the judge make the judgment. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I would. I would. there are certain things that you can do in the United States. And um, uh, my bet is that they're not going to do it. Uh, for several reasons. Uh, number one, of course, is business reasons. I'm going to increase the uh, the sales of Stanley Kubrick DVDs over the next years, and uh, they're greedy, and so I don't think they're going to complain just because of that single reason right there. Um, do you think that uh, Stanley Kubrick was was murdered, as, as some people have speculated about? Well, I you know I, I don't know. I can't. I wasn't there, but I. Um, uh, in 1999, when I first released the Alchemical Kubrick article, I got a, a mysterious phone call from an anonymous person who was uh, one of uh, Kubrick's uh, assistants. And he would not tell me his name, but uh, he answered certain questions well enough for me to know that he definitely knew Stanley. And uh, he, uh, he thought that. He was there when... Uh, when Kubrick showed the film to the Warner Brothers executives, um, so apparently Stanley smoked about 15 cigarettes in the lobby of the theater during the two and a half hours that it was showing to the Warner Brothers executives, and Stanley was extremely worried. And they came out and they were very disappointed in the film and uh, told him that it needed to be edited heavily, and he refused. Mm -hmm. And he went home and died. And um, there's a lot of other strange things that went on during that whole thing. And uh, so, you know, is, is, is Kubrick like Mozart? Did he release secrets and then die? I think he did. And the reason I think he did uh, is because even though Eyes Wide Shut is severely edited, uh, and even though Eyes Wide Shut has severe continuity errors in it, which Kubrick would have never let happen, which means that things have been cut out in between the shots, um, enough is in it to make one realize that Eyes Wide Shut is really a film about Operation Monarch, which is a, a CIA operation, which uses uh, beauty queens to, uh, mind controls beauty queens to infiltrate uh, various organizations and uh, things like that. What's interesting about Eyes Wide Shut is that, and I'm having a total blank now, on the name of Sidney Pollack, but Sidney Pollack's name in the movie, and he's the guy who's playing pool at the end and telling Tom Cruise not to mess with them. Mm -hmm. yeah, the uh, his name, yeah, the doctor, his name in Yiddish is Bricklayer. And uh, Bricklayer is, of course, Mason. And he's obviously the head of it. So, you know, he's the head of the Masons. And uh, Kubrick is, is telling you pretty clearly by using his name that, that that is so. And then you begin looking at other things in Eyes Wide Shut, like the fact that the orgy scene in Eyes Wide Shut was filmed at uh, Nathan Rothschild's mansion outside London. And you begin to put together these things and you begin to realize that uh, Kubrick... I don't know why, but he felt the need to fully explain everything uh, of the occult kind uh, before he died. And it really helps people like me who are going through his films and trying to untangle them to have eyes wide shut because it confirms that there was a, an occult connection in Kubrick's life, and I believe eyes wide shut is really the story of Stanley Kubrick. I believe that he was, he did go to these parties. I do believe that he did rub shoulders with the elites of the world, and uh, he did their bidding. But just like Tom Cruise, and just like Jack Nicholson in The Shining, he even though he it appears that he's been accepted 
into the, the this group. In reality, he is not accepted and will never be accepted and will forever, just like Jack Nicholson, will forever be the, the uh, caretaker of the Overlook, so too will Tom Cruise always be just the house doctor to the elite. Mm-hmm. And uh, so you're, you're accepted into an outer circle as a servant to them. And that's what Kubrick felt that he was, was just a servant to the elite. And this is why he walled himself off in a, in a big estate in London and chased people off with shotguns and things. Uh, and notorious, not because he didn't like people, but because he was so bloody paranoid over what he had seen and what he had done and what he knew Mm -hmm. that he didn't want anyone around him because someone, somebody died. Kubrick is obsessed with this idea, both in The Shining and Eyes Wide Shut, that somebody knew something about him and they paid their life for it, whether it's the girl who saves him at the orgy or whether it's Halloran dying in The Shining, um, he told somebody something. They died because of what Kubrick told him, and this haunted Stanley all the way to the end of his days. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is why he was a a, a recluse and why he was so strange. And um, I think it's completely and totally understandable. And, you know, Kubrick was just a young guy when he got involved in this. He was only 33 when he started getting into this. And... um, and it looked good to him. It looked sexy. It's like the scene in The Shining where Jack Nicholson sees the beautiful woman and he starts kissing her and she turns into an old hag who starts laughing at him. Well, that scene's not in the book. <laughs> that scene is Stanley telling you that he thought this was going to be a sexy thing. This was going to be totally cool. We're going to do the Apollo moon landings, be accepted into the elite, and make any movie he wanted. And it turned out instead to be an old hag laughing at him exactly the opposite of what he expected mm. uh, very interesting uh, what do you think is the i mean there, as, as you point out here there's a, a kind of a story that is being told through many of his films and many different kinds of secrets and many different dramas playing out but do you think that there is a single one most important piece of um, you know information that he was getting out through his movies and if so was that the reason why he was potentially taken out as well yeah i think you can see that you know the way he he starts it out, uh, you know, paths of glory. Well, the killing is really about how he, his, his obsession with time and how he breaks time up into different segments. And, and you can be in the future, and then you can go into the past, and then you can be in the present, and all these things are happening all at once. Incredibly ambitious for a, a guy in his 20s in the 1950s. Um, paths of glory is, is the whole story of... Uh, of what World War I really did to Europe and the corruption that it caused in Europe. And Dr. Strangelove is, you know, his view on the military-industrial complex. 2001 is his alchemical view. Um, Clockwork Orange is about mind control. And ironically, it appears as if the astronauts themselves were Clockwork orange into the fact that they cannot, a lot of them can't remember what we, that was going on on the moon. Mm-hmm. For instance, Edwin Mitchell uh, could not remember what happened to him on the moon, on Apollo 14, and he went to the famous hypnotherapist Robert Masters, whom I knew while he was alive, and Robert Masters told me that Mitchell came to him very troubled because uh, he couldn't remember what it was like to be on the moon, and they took him through a deep amount of hypnotherapy to recover the memories, and they never recovered them um, because they weren't there. <laughs> and uh, uh, Buzz Aldrin, in his book, Return to Earth, which he wrote about the Apollo missions, he talks about the one-year anniversary of Apollo 11, and he's on the stage in, at Las Vegas, uh, a big celebration for the one-year anniversary, and a reporter says, hey, Buzz, come on, tell us the truth. What was it like to be on the moon? And in his own words, and you can read it in the book, he says, I started quivering, my legs got weak, I wanted to throw up, I went out, I I couldn't speak anymore, I went out into the alley and smoked cigarettes until I could recover. So he was clockwork oranged. As soon as the subject came up, he got ill. 
This is why Neil Armstrong won't do any interviews because he's probably going to get sick right, right. talking about it. Yeah. And you know, so this is Kubrick was telling us about about the mind control that was going on before we actually even knew there was such a thing as mind control. And the same thing, Barry Lyndon is about again not being getting close to the elites, but never really being accepted by the elites. You can have the name of the elites, you can have the look and the mannerisms of the elites, but you can never get in. Barry Lyndon could never really get into the elites. The Shining is a story of the Apollo missions and a lot more, also pedophilia, which is another recurrent theme within the uh, work of uh, Stanley Kubrick, which sits under the surface um, but um, it may be that one of the reasons that Stanley was off was that the real story of AI is, uh, was going to be a story of pedophilia cults. And um, they really didn't want that one to get out. So I think he was planning a one-two punch. He was planning an eyes wide shut AI punch that was going to not only you know solidify his stature but was going to reveal the final secrets of this occult society and he was snuffed out um spielberg took the script and rewrote it yeah. and put out a pathetic film and um the rest is history <laughs> um we we know obviously that um as you say, Spielberg took over AI, and there's probably very little left of of what what Kubrick uh, worked on in that movie. Uh, but more curiously, we know that um, Eyes Wide Shut wasn't really completed as well, wasn't it? Now there was uh, many parts missing, there were scenes missing, and certain things. Uh, to me, to this day, when I watch the movie, doesn't uh, make sense. And I wonder what no. what po- what portion you know they left out there. What, what do you make of that, Jay? Well, I think they left out the monarch programming part. Um, I think I think that Nicole Kidman was at the orgy, for instance. I think she was wearing a mask, and she was there when Tom Cruise takes off his mask. I think that the Hungarian uh, is the uh, at the beginning of the film that's dancing with Nicole Kubrick is part of this group, and he seduces her, of which they cut out. I think that um, the um, the entire uh, scene at the end with Sidney Pollack has been completely re-edited. And there's a series of dream sequences, which I saw when I was in France, uh, before the film was released, which are definitely removed. And these were eerie, strange, monarch programming type scenes uh, with Nicole Kidman, which were which were really scary. And uh, they vanished uh, into thin air. This assistant who called me told me that Stanley was really worried about uh, certain parts of Eyes Wide Shut and that the uh, people running the studio would be offended. Mm. But he had a contract, an ironclad contract, with Warner Brothers that said that no one could touch his films. And, um, And so the only film of Stanley Kubrick outside of Spartacus that the editing was not done by Stanley is Eyes Wide Shut. Hmm. And uh, that's a bloody shame. And um, I would have loved to have seen the movie, but you can tell that the movie isn't done by um, certain peculiarities, which any filmmaker knows, which is if you watch a film, there's this aggravating, continuing repeating of lines. So somebody will say, I saw you at the party last night. And then Tom Cruise will say, the party last night? Right, these kinds of things. Mm-hmm. These are things that you you shoot and for good acting, but you cut out in the editing process. Right, this repeating of lines. Right, it's a it's it's a movie thing to get the actors relaxed into their role, but you you cut it out. You don't have them repeat, and so we know that Kubrick had at least one more pass on the editing bench at least before the film was going to be released. And uh, they just uh, went in with a meat cleaver and chopped out all the important stuff and left in all the mistakes. Uh, I don't know why, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, well, I do know why. <laughs> and uh, so you look at it and you can see there's this continuous, um, there's this continuous uh, thread underneath the uh, all of his movies, which is about a 
cult of people who run the world, and what unites this cult, according to Kubrick anyway, is a an overarching um, uh, uh, obsession with uh, children and sex. Yeah, I hate to say it, but that's that's what's going on. And when I get into the third film. Um, I'm going to lower the boom on that, and I'm going to prove it beyond any shadow of a doubt. And I, the few people I've shown it to um, were almost sick with nausea after I showed it to them. And, uh, and Kubrick was definitely putting it in there because, you see, here's the thing about Kubrick. He knew what was going on, and he wanted us to know what was going on, but he couldn't tell us because his wife and his kids would get killed, okay, or him. I mean, he, maybe he died. Who knows? So he put these things into his films knowing that they wouldn't be discovered until long after he died. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the films would be out already, and there's no way you could put the genie back in the bottle. So all it needed was one person to come along and say, hey, have you ever noticed this and this and this and this and this? And then the picture emerges of what is being said to you, and you realize that Santa Kubrick is laying it all on the line, telling us exactly what's happening, and it's really exciting. Uh, pedophilia. Um, I always wondered why, what some, what some of the reasons for this activity is. This is definitely, uh, you know, one of the threads that is running through the whole idea of of an upper establishment and an elite. And um, now, do, when you work with this, do do you have you come to any kind of conclusion when it, when it comes to why? Uh, there, there's two different scenarios as far as I see it here. One is. Uh, this is being done in order to blackmail the people in the network. This is a way to have a hold on people who are joining this inner circle that you talked about. Uh, the other branch to this is that this have ritualistic, uh, uh, satanic aspects in, in, in nature and at the core of it. Uh, maybe both are right, maybe both are wrong. What do you make of this, uh, Jay? Well, I would say both are right. Um, it, it is it is a definitely a, an energy-sucking occult archon thing. Um, which uh, seeks to destroy innocence. Pedophiles are not turned on by young children. Pedophiles are turned on by the idea that they can destroy that young child's innocence. Okay? Mm. That's what they like. And, um, and that's archonic. That's a, that's a demonic archon draining the innocence out of someone uh, kind of thing. And uh, this is what they were doing at the uh, sex orgy in Eyes Wide Shut. And if you, if you really examine the film Lolita, you can see that Peter Sellers and his lady companion are part of a pedophile network that are running down children and uh, trying to uh, get the, uh, 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 James Mason into their pedophile cult. And he, he's so naive, he doesn't realize that he's being invited into the cult, okay? Mm -hmm. And, and he just, his love for Lolita is so strong that he, he just blinded by it, and he doesn't realize what he's being told by Peter Sellers and his lady companion. And again, later in Eyes Wide Shut, when he, when Tom Cruise comes to the costume shop and finds out that the, the girl there is uh, not really an innocent at all. She's part of her father's pedophile uh, service. And um, so it's, it's, it's both. It's how do you compromise, which, you know, maybe even Stanley had been compromised. It's mm -hmm. entirely possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, another, another thing which is interesting about all this, which I'll get into in the third film, is that in the, it, it, all through Stanley Kubrick's films are these teddy bears. They're everywhere in all of his films. It's the very last, one of the very last, I think it's the last shot of Eyes Wide Shut, is Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman watching their daughter walk down the aisle in the shopping store uh, surrounded by bears, teddy bears. Mm -hmm. Now, if you type in pedophile and bears on Google, you'll discover that there's an insignia called pedo bear, which is what pedophiles use to tag a kid who might be in interested. Okay, mm -hmm. and it's a little teddy bear, and what, and if you go further into this, you find out that pedophiles call them pedophiles who are hairy are referred to as bears. Okay, and um, and frankly, Stanley Kubrick comes off as a bear when you look at him. 
Okay? Now, I'm not saying that he was a pedophile. I don't think he was. But I think the pedophiles referred to him as a bear because he was hairy. And um, uh, don't forget that Arthur C. Clarke is a notorious pedophile um, who was Stanley's, one of Stanley's best friends in London at the time of making a 2001. And um, so we see that he's, he's hanging out with, with Arthur C. Clarke and his group of people who are mysteriously linked into the uh, German scientists that Arthur C. Clarke is trying to get into NASA in the early 60s. Um, uh, and uh, you begin to realize that there's a, a deeper connection here between um, Arthur C. Clarke's predilections and NASA. And I mean, it gets really strange. I mean, this, you know, there's all sorts of odd things going on in, inside this story, uh, you know, that that don't don't seem connected, but actually they may be. Mm-hmm. For for instance, one of the things that drove Jim Garrison crazy in the uh, Kennedy uh, investigation in the assassination of Kennedy was that right before uh, he got the job at the uh, school book depository. Uh, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was working at a company called Riley's Coffee Company in um, in New Orleans, and when Garrison went to talk to all the employees at Riley's Coffee Company about Lee Harvey Oswald, he discovered that there were no more employees there, even though it was only a year or two later that that knew Lee Harvey Oswald. So he decided to track down these ex-employees and find out where they were and talk to them. And guess where they all went? They all moved to Houston and became members of NASA. Okay. The strange thing to move from an employee of a coffee company to an employee of NASA, I find. Sure, sure. And uh, Garrison went to his death. He wrote me a couple times about this, and he went to his death trying to figure out what why there was this NASA connection everywhere that he looked, including Texas, where uh, Kennedy was killed, uh, which is, uh, Johnson was, you know, really NASA's senator, that's what he was called. And um, so you look at this and you can see that, you know, you look at Barry Nelson at the beginning of The Shining, the uh, manager of the Overlook, and he has a toupee that makes him a dead ringer for JFK. Okay, and uh, you start looking at all this stuff, and you realize that he's trying to tell you this, right? And uh, it just gets just gets stranger and stranger. I mean, I have a list of all the credits uh, of the people who helped Stanley in 2001, and you know, it is a a military industrial complex list of all the criminal companies that developed these weapons for the United States, that that's who helped him. Why would they help him make a science fiction film? Uh, companies generally just don't, you know, contribute uh, uh, employees to pro- other private enterprises uh, for free. So, you know, mm-hmm. why are they helping Stanley? Why, why are they all getting together and helping him? And the answer is, is because... They're fleecing the United States people out of forty billion dollars that was supposed to go to the Apollo Moon program, um, and by faking it. <laughs> and and you, do you think that this money then actually went to the real uh, space program behind the scenes? I do. Yeah, I do, and yeah. I think the people that were working on NASA, and those are the people who are the most upset with me. By the way, I get a lot of emails from people who were working at Rocketdyne and and McDonnell Douglas and these companies is working for NASA and they're really angry at me because they say well I did all this work and you're telling me that it was just a big fake well you did do all the work it's true you did good work I'm sure yeah. but you weren't doing it for Apollo you're doing it for the secret space program <laughs> <laughs> it's quite crazy. brilliant too yeah. well exactly that, that, that's quite interesting I definitely want to talk more about that I that's one thing about the the occult uh, NASA connection that I've been reading about that it's more the most obvious one to me I guess in that sense that has to do with the uh, the developments that happened at uh, White Sands uh, specifically JPL uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory we have people like Jack Parsons and and the so-called Babylon bunch doing some interesting uh, ritual magic connected to uh, you know the the JPL facility and all that as well that's one of the more oh, yeah. obvious ones that I know about but beyond that what what else is there out there in terms of NASA that are connecting the threads to this uh, the, the upper elite the establishment uh, Jay well i mean the, the most interesting thing of course is uh, that the um 
the scientists in Germany that developed all of this stuff were all members of a group called the Saturnian Society. And um, they, I, I'm not, you know, we don't really know all that much about the Saturnian Society, but um, I just find it interesting that, you know, they named the rocket the Saturn V, even though it was going to the moon, which was strange. And, um, uh, but, but more interesting than that is the obsession that NASA has had with Saturn. And, uh, uh, you know, in, in including, you know, sending the, the big ship that's out there now, uh, uh, collecting thousands and thousands of images of Saturn and its moons. And, um, you know, you, you just gotta wonder what's, what's going on. And if you, if you read, um, Ring Makers of Saturn, which is an astonishing book, uh, 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 by a scientist here in the United States, Bergson, uh, about, um, the, uh, uh, objects that uh, the Voyager uh, photographed in the rings of Saturn uh, during the Voyager flyby, and uh, um, uh, you know, uh, the things that uh, the um, that they're picking up now, uh, especially with on Titan and uh, the hexagonal rings on Saturn yeah. and things, you, you start wondering. You you have to wonder what Saturn actually is. And uh, the the myths around Saturn and everything are just so interesting. Uh, and then you realize at, at a certain point that this cult is a Saturnian cult. And it, it, it and if you go into the mythology, you realize that Saturn was really that 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 there's a war, a, kind of a spiritual war between the followers of Jehovah or Jupiter and the followers of Saturn or Set. Okay, mm -hmm. Jehovah means Jupiter, Zeus. The followers of Jehovah, the Christians, the Muslims, and the Jews, are actually following Zeus, because Jehovah is Jove, which translates directly to Zeus. And all they did was they just got rid of all the other gods and made Zeus the primary god. And the same thing with Saturn. He Saturn was the god before Jehovah, before the... Um, the Jovian religions came 3,000 years ago. The people were, were worshiping Saturn and Set, who is the Egyptian god. And, um, and Saturn is time and Kronos and, and, and all these things. And you begin thinking that, you know, there's something about Saturn that we haven't quite figured out that they know. Yeah. And, um, I think that Saturn might be some kind of, hyperdimensional gateway or something mm -hmm. um i'm not sure uh i just know that uh um there's things that are going on on saturn which are absolutely mind-boggling and um and uh, nasa knows about it and another interesting thing about about this is in 2005 there was a tv series in the united states called revelations and it only lasted six shows. It was a summer replacement. Really wasn't a very good show. And it was financed by the Catholic Church. And in this show, Bill Pullman is a scientist, and there's a some beautiful actress. I forget her name. She's playing a nun. Believe me, the most beautiful nun you've ever seen. And um, they're chasing the Antichrist, okay, mm -hmm. all over the world, who's about to destroy the world. And in the film, it turns out that the Antichrist has a secret box, and uh, inside, on the on the front of the box is a picture of Saturn, and there's a moon right next to the picture of Saturn. And uh, Bill Pullman points at the moon, and he says, it's a black moon. And he says, what's this? And the nun says, that's the black moon of Saturn. That's where the Antichrist lives. Well, this is one year after they uh, took the pictures of, um, of um, uh, Iapetus, right. okay, which is a black moon, uh, about six months after Hoagland came out with his brilliant analysis of, of Iapetus, 
And um, at the very end of the series, they they defeat the Antichrist, but you know they got to have a sequel because it's a TV show. And so they're standing out on a cliff overlooking the ocean. They won their battle against the Antichrist. Blah blah blah. And they look up at a star, and the camera pull, zooms into the star. Turns out the star is really Saturn. And the very last shot of the show is this black moon rising over the frame, covering the frame. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is all very odd because here's the thing. The place where the black monolith is in the book 2001 A Space Odyssey is on the moon Iapetus. Mm -hmm. And you start putting this together and you realize that these guys must have had knowledge. These German guys must have had knowledge about Saturn from something. But they knew that there was something about Saturn. Kubrick was going to Saturn in 2001. In the book, they actually go to Saturn. He changed it to Jupiter, said he couldn't make the rings look realistic enough. I don't buy it. <laughs> I think they came in and they said, no, 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 you, you can't make it Saturn. It's just too obvious. Mm -hmm. It's just too clear. You can't have it land on Iapetus because one day we're going to take a picture of Iapetus and they're going to say they're all going to squawk about the huge coincidences of us, you know, here in 1965, uh, knowing about all this when we're not supposed to know about it. And um, you know, or even more intriguing, if my German friends and contacts are right, the had already developed technology by 1961, 62. Uh, to actually go out there, and they knew all about it by then. Mm. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke uh, probably had some knowledge about this. Then, do you think that because you alluded to earlier that he was uh, part of the the inner network there in one way or another, right? Absolutely. In fact, I'm sure that he and Kubrick and Herman Olberth and uh, 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 Werner von Braun and some of the more secret Germans that we don't know about that were quite brilliant. Um, well, they sat around in Arthur C. Clarke's apartment, uh, drinking brandy and smoking cigars and talking into the night about all this stuff. And Kubrick's this kid, practically, right? Going, oh my God, you know, mm -hmm. what is this, right? And excited and tried to fit it into his, uh, his, uh, his scheme of things and, uh, uh got a lot of it in. Uh, another interesting thing is Anthony Burgess was one who wrote Clockwork Orange was asked um, one time where he got the idea, and he said he got it from Stanley Kubrick in a conversation in 1964. Hmm. Interesting. So yeah, so A Clockwork Orange was, uh, what, what happened? Well, maybe Kubrick said, well, listen, I'm not going to do this, fake this Apollo moon landing crap, because the uh, the astronauts will talk eventually, and then we'll all look like idiots. And they showed him how they could get the astronauts not to talk. He saw the Levico technique and, uh, um, and told uh, Burgess about it, and then Burgess wrote a book. Uh, I wondered, when we talked a bit earlier about Buzz Aldrin, uh, he, he not too long ago made a comment about uh, a monolith found on Phobos. I, I bet you saw that one, and if so, wh why is he speaking about that particular thing right now when he couldn't remember basic stuff about the moon? What is he on about now? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, Buzz knows the truth, of course. He knows he didn't go. He knows that there's a secret space program, and there, he and is trying to um, to get us to go do, get us to reveal it so that we can go to Phobos and look at this stuff. And, you know, we've already been to Phobos probably uh, several times, um, and he knows that too. And um, so, you know, the, he, a lot of these guys are irritated. They were told years and years ago that, yeah, we'll keep, we'll keep a lid on it, you know, for 10 or 15 years, and then we'll release the fact that we have this, all this technology, and everyone in the world will be better placed because we'll have energy that's uh, clean and efficient and all that, and then they never do it. And uh, uh, these guys like Buzz Aldrin and Richard Hoagland and all these other guys are all irritated that, you know, the promises aren't being kept. And uh, so they're pressuring them to release this stuff. But I got news for all of those guys. They are not going to release it ever. Um, we're not, we're not, they don't want us to know about it. They don't want us to have it. And uh, there's basic, you know, reasons for that too. Hmm. So um, I want to talk a little bit more about, I mean, some of the symbolism here in terms of Saturn as well, the, the Lord of the Rings, right? Uh, representing time, 
uh, death. You know, in some cases we can see, you know, the Cronus or Saturn with a an hourglass and all this as well. Uh, it's quite interesting when you get into it, and I even think that there is. Uh, a hint of this in the most basic the, the NASA logo as well. Many people say it's a rocket taking off with this kind of uh, V or U-shaped, uh, uh, but that looks to me like the red rings of Saturn around a blue planet. What do you make of that, uh, Jay? I, I, I completely agree with you. And, uh, um, and yeah, the Lord of the Rings. Okay, so here we have J.R.R. Tolkien, who's um, the only person who can read the books that are in the basement of the uh, of the uh, um, British of the Oxford at Oxford. Okay, he's got all these uh, books and uh, from Finland and Sweden, and and he's the only guy who can actually read them. All right, and he spends hours and hours, hundreds of hours of hours reading all this stuff uh, that's down there. And he writes Lord of the Rings after he's done reading it, okay? And, 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 and he says to his friends, like C.S. Lewis, he says, he says, he says that there's a whole history and we don't even know about it. And he told people in his letters that, that Lord of the Rings was about Europe 6,500 years ago, that, you know, the Irish were the hobbits and the, uh, uh, the uh, elves were the, the Nords, and, you know, he had this whole thing figured out. And, and he said this is all based on truth, and he would, he would get angry when people said, well, you know, this is all analogy and metaphor, and he would say, no, it isn't me- analogy and metaphor. This is what I learned from what I'm my reading. Mm-hmm. And one of the things he gets is that there's this Lord of the Rings, like Saturn, and his name is Sauron. And Sauron is obviously, you know, so close to the Mesopotamian dictator Sargon, who invented time, literally invented time. He invented clocks and calendars and schedules and and really delivered the world into the linear uh, monochronic world that we live in right now. Um, uh, The world before that was polychronic, but uh, Sargon... Um, was uh, created the monochronic world and um, and really thrust us into civilization, if you want to call it that. Mm-hmm. And so he he, he understands this uh, Tolkien, and he's trying to show us that the Saturnian um, power came in and forced us into a kind of slavery, uh, wrecking the planet, destroying the planet and um, using up all the energy of the planet for its own um, devices, we don't really know, reading Lord of the Rings or watching the movies, we don't really know what it is that Sauron is trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Not really. And outside of conquering the world. And, um, And what it is, is he's trying to destroy the elves who know too much and have too much power, and he's trying to um, trap the Earth into his uh, uh, into an energy sucking thing, and he's creating half breeds of uh, uh, clones, uh, the orcs and all those who are not really uh, human, and uh, they're only partially human, just like the archons. And he knows all this, and he's reading all this, and he's. He's he's absorbing it and and he's getting it and and so this knowledge was in in our own histories and it has been wiped out by these archons uh, these forces that don't want us to figure out you know what's going on. Uh, there is so much uh, to to Saturn. I've heard other people speculate also that obviously X. Um, amount of thousand uh, years ago, we had a different, potentially a different composition in our own solar system, and that uh, the fact that Saturn was much closer, uh, mm-hmm. w- the rings of Saturn was even visible from from our planet, which, and that's why w- that's the idea where where we got the idea for adopting, uh, you know, Saturn as being the the lords of the planets in that sense. I don't know how much you've looked into that, Jay, but do you think that this is where they got the idea of, of venerating Saturn so much, or is is there another connection to uh, to, to Saturn that, that we can talk about? Well, I have heard and read that stuff, and, uh, you know, it's intriguing, and there's no doubt that the solar system could have been rearranged in a periodic catastrophe of some kind. But I think what actually, you know, uh, Saturn is, is, it is, it is, um, 
It is a device that is creating linear time in the solar system. It's a timing device. And it's a higher dimensional timing device that allows um, a semi-linear uh, 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 um, stream of time. And this is being done because uh, uh, the only way that certain powers can get things done is through taking us out of a polychronic world i.e. hunter-gatherer or farmers or people who don't really, you know, they just get up when the sun goes up and they go to bed when the sun goes down to a monochronic world where we can all meet uh, on airplanes and uh, uh, create uh, machines and factories and go to work all at the same time. <laughs> and so Saturn is, Saturn is the, uh, the god that sets us. He sets us into something and then we can't get out. And that's, it's, it's a trap, it's a time trap. And uh, that's what I think Saturn is. And I think all the symbology around Saturn shows that he's, he's, it's a time trap. And he needs human sacrifice uh, to, um, to keep going. In other words, old man time, uh, it turned into young baby time only through the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a sacrifice that has to happen. And, um, and he's carrying, you know, the, the, the scythe because he's the grim reaper also. That's right. He's, uh, yeah. And he's coming through and he's, and he's, ch he's gathering up the bodies. Well, what is he gathering up the bodies for? What does he need that for? Because he's sucking the energy of those bodies. That's what he's doing. And he's the grim reaper. So he's the grim reaper. He's father time. He's Kronos. He's Satan. He's set. He's, um, he 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 is the uh, embodiment of of this kind of uh, time trap that we're all caught in right now. And uh, when we can break from the time trap, then we'll be free of 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 Saturn and things. But the solar system does look like it was constructed as a time trap for us. Hmm. Um, why I can't say, except slavery uh, reasons. Interesting. Uh, in one of the mythological stories as well, he ends up eating his own children. This We have this That's aspect right. of uh, sacrifice again. Mm -hmm. it, it needs a, a sacrifice in order to continue its own its own process in one sense. And uh, that, that's obviously an, an obvious tie-in to this idea that we have ritualistic slash, you know, satanic sacrifices taking place, you know, at the same time as there is um, certain... This weird sexual behavior that we talked about earlier, pedophilia, what have you, seems, you know, we have the murder aspect tied in with that as well, don't, don't we, uh, Jay? That's right. It is, it's, to me, it's all connected. And it's exactly what Stanley Kubrick is saying. The overarching story that connects all of his films together is that if only he'd been allowed to um, keep it Saturn in 2001, it would be clear and obvious that this is what he's doing. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, he changed it to, to Jupiter, and uh, um, the only reason that we even know that it was Saturn is because special effects technicians like Douglas Trumbull have come forth and said, you know, they spent a year designing Saturn, and then they had to throw it out and uh, mm -hmm. go to Jupiter. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, you know, yes, I think yeah, uh, it's a... I'll just be explicit here. It is a Saturnian cult that um, is uh, archon based and the archons uh, the the word for ar archon in Greek is arctos which means bear okay uh, so the secret word for archons among themselves is bear and they uh, he put bears all over his films everywhere all over him. In an AI, the kid has a genetically right. modified teddy bear. That's right. and, um, and, and he's saying, and think about this. Who would want to buy a 12-year-old lifelike boy that never ages? Would a mother really want a boy that never ages, never right. gets married, never goes to college, right. never is a job, never has a career? No. There's really only one group that would want a boy or a girl that would never age. 
Okay, Kubrick had to know this yeah. when he started it. And I believe, and I can prove, and I will prove, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that he was, that he was making a con, uh, conspicuous film about a pedophile cult that was using these robots. Okay. And it was going to be explosive, believe me. Interesting. Uh, I mean, overall, the bear uh, cult seems to be one of the oldest uh, animal worship uh, worshiping cults there is on the planet as well. If we look at some of the, uh, uh, the, the art around the world in many of the cave systems and so forth as well, uh, right. bears are always coming up in one way or another. Uh, now, do you personally believe that this ha has to do an, an astrological connection to Ursa Major, or is it, as you say here, is it more, you know, on the nose obvious that that, that this is uh, tied to Saturn then in, in some way, are you saying? Well, I, yeah, you know, I mean, I have to get into kind of a, a odd hyperdimensional physics, but it, it's it's like if you um, if you want to enter into the Earth stream from outside, you've got to come in on the North Pole. Um, it's a hyperdimensional thing, I, but they take me an hour or two to explain it in the physics of it. But the path of least resistance would be to come in at the North Pole. But uh, the um, but but the the ancient texts, the Nag Hammadi, they insinuate that the archons come from the region of Saturn. Mm -hmm. Now a lot of people think, oh, that means Set or Satan and all that. And it may be, I don't know, but. Um, so I believe that they, they enter and they enter in through the North Pole and they come down in here and, and, and commiserate with us and, um, and uh, the, they suck the life of the planet and of us. And that's what they're doing. And they're keeping the planet and us on life support so that they can continuously uh, uh, drain our energy. Uh, they seek, they love war and death and the three religions of Jupiter or Jehovah um, uh, are the warrior religions, the religions that want to kill and destroy. And I guess the ultimate wet dream of the chief archon is for the Islamists, the Christians, and the Jews to just murder each other in a gigantic ritual bloodbath. Right. And that does seem to be what, 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 what is going on here. <laughs> and the people who think that there's a democracy coming to Egypt are out of their minds. <laughs> Muslim Brotherhood is one of the most radical organizations possible. Um, Islam is, uh, you know, I'm not going to make any friends here, but Islam, as John Lash says, is the third variation of this disease. And it will be the worst. So we have a you know, a very dangerous thing going on here where a Saturnian cult, uh, or a Jehovian cult, is going to take over the world, and this Jehovian cult is ruled by a, a secret Saturnian cult. And um, it's really quite terrifying, and um, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, you know, some of the, my favorite cities in Europe are being destroyed, uh, by uh, by the Islamists, I'm sorry to say it, but they're ruining everything, and they're ruining the United States. And uh, these people are fanatics and scary, and uh, and they follow a, 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 a vicious, bloodthirsty, warmongering god, uh, basically. I want to talk more about that in our next uh, hour here as well. I know that. Uh... There's interesting connections there in terms of some of the things that uh, Al Albert Pike talked about allegedly in his letters to Mazzini and what have you about mm -hmm. a third world war this being uh, instigated yeah. and, and uh, spurred along in terms of uh, the fights between Zionism, Christianity and Islam pretty much. And that's an interesting connection there as well. And what the whatever the goal of that was, if they are indeed part of the Satur Saturnian cult that is kind of overseeing uh, this whole thing, because on, on, on the surface, this is very... A lot of irrational people are obviously, you know, siding with different sides within this kind of uh, uh, war that seems to be going on between the religions. But let's address that a little bit more in the in the next hour, sure. uh, Jay, and take a little break here. But I, I do want to uh, obviously talk a little bit about your websites uh, here as well, uh, jwidener dot com, uh, sacredmysteries dot com as well. And we've been talking about many different things, obviously. But again, the movie that you do have out now is called Kubrick's Odyssey Part One. Uh, now, do you have other websites or other uh, things you'd like to mention and plug to our listeners here before we round things up with first hour, Jay? No, that's it. Just if you're interested in the new film, Kubrick's Odyssey, or my other film, Infinity, The Ultimate Trip, 
or any of our films, you can just go to sacredmysteries.com. It's all available. It's uh, any, any country can play them. It's universal coding on the DVDs. And if you want free stuff, a lot of high weirdness, then yeah, go to my uh, own website, jwidener.com, and and read my uh, my uh, uh, reflections of my inner madness, I guess. <laughs> All right, well, the website's here again now, uh, jwidener.com and sacredmysteries.com. We will have these linked up on redeyesquarations.com as well. Do take a look, very, very interesting stuff uh, for you. Stay with us, Jay. We'll be right back with more after this break. In the second hour with Jay Widener, we begin to discuss Albert Pike's plan for three world wars and how Islam, Zionism and Christianity will be used to instigate the third one. We put this in the context of multiculturalism. And considering how things are developing in Europe and in the United States, it seems like the philosophy of the clash of civilizations is coming to life. We also talk about 2012, the information revolution, knowledge and the rebellion of the intelligence. Don't miss our two with Jay Widener. Log in or sign up at RedEyesCreations.com to tune in to this or any of our previous programs. Thank you for staying with us.